Okay. Um, firstly, I would like to thank um, Sikkim for giving me the honor of doing this presentation uh, today on the opening day of the conference. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, the study we've been doing for the last number of years on wild honeybees in Ireland. Um, and for a long time, uh, it was thought that they didn't exist. And we have, through the help of beekeepers and members of the public, um, found quite a lot of honeybee colonies living wild in Ireland. And so some of these pictures on, on this cover here rep represent those. So um, the first thing to notice is that, yeah, they they have adapted to using um, the absence of trees in Ireland. So they have adapted to using roof spaces and, and cavities and walls. Um, and also members of the public, for example, have taken a number of these pictures. So the top left, the one in the middle, um, have been taken by members of the public and sent in. And then other members of the public or beekeepers call in and let us know uh, where where we can find these colonies and take us around to neighbours and friends who have colonies in their roofs, as represented by the top right and the bottom left corner. Here is a, a local beekeeper uh, in Gort in County Galway who, who brought us to these two um, sites where there have been bees living in these roofs for a number of years. So this is collaborative work. Um, it wouldn't be possible without uh, the team that I have in the university at NUI Galway, um, including technical staff, Owen and Maeve, um, PhD students, like this was formed a bit of Keith Brown's PhD. Uh, we had a visiting uh, student, a uh, visiting researcher from Italy, Roberto, who contributed an awful lot as well. And in the centre here is Chiara, who's a visiting um, master's student from Italy. And then Stephen, so some of the current work we're doing at the moment on pool seek data is being processed by, by Stephen, who's doing a PhD in data science. Um, and on the right, we have uh, collaborators, uh, Elise and Dora from, from Portugal, as well as Gabrielle, um, who have collaborated on, on the SNP assays and microsatellites. And of course, it wouldn't be possible without um, funding from various sources and from support of the um, beekeeping societies in Ireland, the Native Irish Honeybee Society and the Federation of Irish Beekeepers Associations, and loads and loads of beekeepers across the country and members of the public who have reported in the pre um, have reported in um, honeybee colonies in Ireland. Sorry. So when I started uh, working in this field in, in kind of the end of 2013, um, I was approached by some beekeepers to um, help provide some scientific evidence for, for supporting um, initiatives in Ireland for supporting native Irish honeybees. Um, and I became involved in providing scientific evidence for the Native Irish Honeybee Society. And I was surprised really um, at how little work had been done in honeybees in Ireland, but also um, I came across a lot of um, I suppose uncertainty and doubt about the existence of Apis mellifera, mellifera still in the country, that it was all hybridized or, or vanished um, because of, um, so the two quotes here on the top left, um, even back from, you know, 1920s, um, it was reported that the country was wiped clean of or clear of bees. And also Brother Adam um, has been quoted a lot as saying that the native Irish bees in the UK or the British Isles at that time were completely wiped out by the Isle of Wight disease. Um, and further than that, so not just the, obviously the absence of Apis mellifera mellifera in the country, but also um, there was thought to be a huge decline and an absence then of wild colonies with the introduction of Roa. Roa came to Ireland in the late 1990s. And of course, when that hit Ireland, um, it decimated the population of honeybees, particularly those in the wild. So they became very, very rare for sure. Um, and then, you know, further reading and, and listening to people talking and, and reading some works, we see that especially the work of Norman Carrick gave us great, um, I think, confidence that we could have something left in Ireland here because the work, his work and the work of people he has cited suggest that um, AMM firstly is native to the British Isles. And then also that Brother Adam may have been incorrect in his assumption that that the subspecies was wiped out. Certainly the population plummeted, but that doesn't mean that it was it was met extinct. And that was the assumption that kind of came into my ears when I started working. So um, of course, there was no evidence that AMM had vanished and there was no evidence that wild bees had gone extinct in Ireland. So but certainly like the quotes on the right here um, are typical from not just um, 
you know, normal members of the public or, or people with a vested interest, but a lot of beekeepers, members of the public, even conservation biologists. The NPWS here is um is the National Parks and Wildlife Service, so it's the government agency reason, re responsible for conservation of our native fauna and flora. And so there was a general understanding here that AMM really no longer existed and certainly not in the wild. But the pictures down the bottom reflect that this isn't true. And actually, while they may have taken a knock, certainly wild honeybee colonies um, are found in old and new buildings um, throughout the country, as well as in tree cavities. So as a background, I think an important element here about um, AMM in Ireland is that actually most Irish beekeepers keep Abus and Lifram Lifra, even if a lot of people don't really realize what they have. Um, when you ask them, they keep dark bees and their bees are dark. So we carried out a survey and I'm not presenting much of this here, but just for background, this was we we followed the methods of of um, that produced or published by Gouchard et al. So Matthew, the previous talk, um, they published a nice paper based on a results of a survey carried out amongst dark dark be breeders in Switzerland and he kind of gave us permission to adapt it and apply it in Ireland. Um, and so we did and this results 340 beekeepers responded and we see that over 90% of them keep dark bees and the reasons for that are you know really encouragingly a lot of them think the conservation of native bees is really important. Also that it's the bees present in the environment and it's the best bee for the local environment. So there is an awareness amongst beekeepers in Ireland about the importance of Avis and from Lifra. So this is really great and it shows that, you know, beekeepers in Ireland, you know, a lot of them, heritage is important, but the work of the Native Irish Honey Bee Society is getting out there as well. Um, and then work by Jaffa et al in 2010 suggested that uh, wild honeybees could be present in Ireland because using a genotyping approach, um, they carried out some work in, there's a, a couple of papers, a few papers, um, uh, Moritz's group, um, looking at the likelihood of the presence of wild bees in Africa, comparing Africa and Germany and other countries in Europe and suggested that um, in Ireland, wild bees could be present. Whereas that wasn't the case. It was also the case in a place in Italy, but not elsewhere. So they showed, for example, that in Germany, um, the genotypic data that was coming back from the bees that were sampled was consistent with the with the diversity that was present in the managed bees. Um, whereas in Ireland it was um there was greater diversity sampled than was than could be anticipated from the managed bee um population. So I just thought that it was good um a good thing to, you know, check out and see what's what's happening in Ireland, whether AMM was present and, and um common and also whether we had wild honeybee colonies. Because when I started talking at conferences and beekeeper meetings, Beekeepers were telling me about bees living in chimneys for periods of time and they were collecting swarms from them. Um, so there was a kind of an interest building um, about bees living in their natural environment. So we thought we'd have a look and there wasn't any funding for this because the um, funding agencies that I applied for funding told me that wild bees don't exist, so they weren't going to fund me to find them. So we really did this with very few resources. So Keith Brown, my PhD student, and I just started looking. We um, wrote articles for the national newspaper, the Irish Times. Um, and then Keith also set up Facebook and Twitter accounts. And we had a huge response. Actually, we weren't expecting such a large response at all. And we had a larger response than we could actually cope with. What we did do was follow 76 colonies um, over. We tracked them over a period of, of three, four years. We're still tracking them now today. So this kind of started 2016, although we had one or two colonies from 2015 that were reported before we launched this article. So these just show you some of the places where we sampled these colonies. So we do find them in in trees um, so high up in trees, normally ash, beech and oak. Are, are good candidates. But also in Ireland, we don't have very good tree cover compared to other European countries. Um, and so you'll see now a lot of pictures of um, places where bees have just adapted to the absence of trees and they have, at, um, oh, sorry, they have um, started to um, colonize um, other spaces. Oh my God. So here we go have some pitch roofs. So these um, will be very typical um, of places. So where, where the fascias and the soffits haven't been plugged up enough. This one is obviously unfinished building. 
Um, the picture on the right is from a cottage um, that has been lived in now. There's two ecologists living in here for the last 10 years now and the bees had been present for at least um, seven of those years um, and were still going strong. Unfortunately, they had to fix the roof um, this year and so the, we, we took out the bees but um, didn't manage to, to, the colony didn't manage to survive. We didn't catch the queen. Uh, a lot of holiday homes, um, especially in rural Ireland, there's a lot of um, isolated cottages, isolated sheds. So this on the bottom left is a is a farm shed with a hole in the wall that has been not hasn't been maintained. And so Colin has lived in here for quite a few years. It has since died out. This one next to it on the right is a, a, a wall in a walled garden in Dublin. And there are bees living here now since 2016 um, and they have colonized other parts of that wall. And then lots of old old um, sheds and outhouses and garages. We have a lot of um, old buildings in Ireland. We have a, a long history, archaeo archaeological history. So we have a lot of ruined castles and old townhouses where um, so this one on the left in, in County Clare, or County Limerick actually, Limerick Clare, close to each other, has been monitored in, um, by Beekeeper for many years and he has collected swarms from this um, site over many years. And on the right is Portumna Castle. And they have, we've watching three swarms, not three colonies here since 2016. One of them has um, died out, but the others are going strong. And uh, we are in touch with the Office of Public Works in Ireland, which manage a lot of these old places across the country. So we're going to survey the rest of um, their buildings uh, in collaboration with them for wild honeybee colonies. And this was one that captured actually the interest of journalists at the time. And this was a hollow, hollowed out statue um, that had, a be, had to be replaced and had to be fixed. And so the, the statue had to come down and there was a, a colony of bees living in that statue. Um, of course, this is one example where, you know, the skeptics would enjoy because the, the queen in this case was actually um, clipped and marked. And um, so it was a, a swarm from a managed and nearby managed colony. But many of the times that's not the case. And many of these colonies have been observed and monitored by local people for many years. Um, it's true that in some cases, even though they're monitored for many years, uh, there's actually a replacement. The colony dies out and it's replaced by others. But in many cases, these colonies live in people's houses and their roofs and they see them every day and they love their bees and they watch out for them every day. So there are people who will swear hand on heart that the, there have been swarms outwards from the colony, but in, not inwards. And we're trying to develop methodologies that we can prove that using pool sequ um, genome sequencing. We use many different methods to collect them um, from a sim before we got our, our bug vacuum. Uh, we were using simply jars put up against the, the colony entrance. We're using nets and then we have this uh, bug buster vacuum where we it's very, very gentle, um, very gentle vacuuming. So it doesn't harm the bees at all. And we just very gently scoop them up. So this work was published, this first work tracking the bees for um, three years. Um, four years here, 2015 to 19, was published in, in the end of 2020 um, in JAR. And uh, what this really shows, you know, in some cases, the, the colonies were replaced or they died out. Um, many cases, as Tom Seeley has found, they, they died out very quickly um, within a couple of years, but then some of them have, have survived and we still have 16 of those original 76 colonies are still um, going strong today. 11 of them first sampled in 2016 and five of them in 2017. So free living bees would seem to be surviving beyond the time expected, given the presence of Roa. Uh, we did manage to, of those 16, there's actually 14 that you would regard as being the same because two of them we observed a change in the maternal lineage from M lineage to C lineage. So somewhere in the last only year or two, they've gotten hybridized. So we used a number of different methods in this first study to look at uh, the genotype of the bees. Uh, the first one was mitochondrial DNA to look at the maternal lineage. And here we compared homologous DNA sequences from the classic region CO1 to CO2. So that's between the CO1 gene and the CO2 gene. There's an intragenic region here that's quite variable in honeybees. So we sequenced it um, from hundreds of bees um, and uh, basically we identified changes and we compared it to any of the database sequences and we compared it to the other um, 
be samples that we taken in Ireland from managed bees that was published in 2018. And what we see here, much like the Hassett paper in 2018, uh, we see that a lot of the um, free living bees are have an identical mitochondrial haplotype to the Dutch bees that were originally sequenced by Pinto et al. in 2014. And this may reflect the historical importation of a lot of Dutch bees into Ireland back in the 1920s when the original decimation happened, the Irish government at the time imported large amounts of, of skeps of bees from the Netherlands. And whether it's that is what we're seeing now through the mitochondrial sequencing of the current bees, or if it's that these haplotypes happen to be fitter, because there is some evidence to suggest now that mitochondrial DNA can confer um, fitness um, and that some haplotypes across different animal species are just confer a greater fitness than others. So we, we have more work to check to see whether what we're seeing here is, is this um, importation or is it coincidental. But what we do see are quite a number of um, novel haplotypes or novel variants in, in Ireland. Some of them are shared with the managed population and the ones in grey here are distinct um, variants that haven't been described so far. Now, there's not a huge number of mitochondrial sequences in the databases yet. So as more studies um, provide more data, we'll see how unique these are. What is interesting here in this first study is that all of the maternal, all of the free living bees showed a maternal lineage that was M. So this is consistent with the queen and going back in time was an M queen. So there's no hint of of, of colonies being headed up at any time by a sea lineage queen. Um, this was followed up by a SNP, um, ap application of a SNP method uh, to this work. Um, and this was published by Dora Henriquez and Keith Brown et al. And this was using the SNP panel that was developed by Elise Pindle's lab in Portugal. And um, Keith went over there to work with them for a little while. And we sequenced, uh, we processed, sorry, through their assay, um, a number of our free living bees shown here in the right hand side in the green. And again, the vast majority of the bees are pure AMM and three of the colonies only showed um, significant hybridization. Um, and this was very different from um, a study of feral bees. I don't like the word feral, but at the time they were called feral bees in the UK, where they found that um, the, the feral bees were hybridized, but that's equivalent to what you see in the managed population. We also use microsatellites and the microsatellites we use were the same panel that were developed by Gabrielle Salon and has been used by her and some other um, other studies since then. So we used her reference panel of C populations, Carnica and Ligustica, and also M um, populations from Europe. And the only thing I want to show on this slide really is that um, that little grey circle in the middle, it just is comparing the allele frequencies between the, the free living population in Ireland and the free living population of other AMM um, populations in Europe. Um, and the one on the bottom where, where the circle is, is the managed population. And because of all of the, the pairwise comparisons are clustered on the line, it just shows that the free living population in Ireland is indistinguishable from the managed population. Um, so there's very little introgression though in either the managed or the wild honeybee population in Ireland, thankfully. This is just after one year. Uh, this was just put, written up as an article in, again, the, the National Beekeeping Journal, um, where you can see that the reports are right across the country. Um, so there are gaps in the middle here and there. Um, now up to this year, this year we didn't publish it. Uh, we didn't do any media this year and the numbers of, of reports are, are dropping down. Um, so we need to relaunch some media um, coverage for this in the new year with our new project. But we have over 400 reports. We're trying to get to validate them all and sample them all. But as you can imagine, right across the country, it's quite difficult to do, particularly when a lot of students in Ireland don't drive. So it's relying on me or a technician to bring them places. Um, I have a student, Chiara, who was looking at basically, um, you can see that most of the, the reports are kind of concentrated in urban areas. And so she's been looking at our our wild, our parks, um, national parks and woodlands um, to see, to try and identify 
um, additional sites and more r- remote sites where, where we might have wild bees living in trees. So, so that work we're hoping to continue into the future. And you can see the just the picture down in the bottom is that a lot of the the, the there are some uh, reports in trees, but a lot of a lot of the reports are coming from buildings, and this is consistent with our low tree cover. But we're hoping to redress that balance. The other reason for that is that we're relying for this on on reports from members of the public, and of course, members of the public are more likely to see uh, colonies where they're living in their houses or their farm. Um, buildings and so on. Um, so we're hoping with Kiara's work and with collaborations with, with other people that we'll start to record more of the trees, tree cavities. So from this new work, some pictures of some of the colonies from this more recent work. This is a Bunratty Castle down in, in County Clare. And um, this is really cool. Uh, so in that picture, in that window that circled and the picture on the right is the um, are the colonies. So we can sample that but we can monitor to see how long it's surviving. So that's, uh, I just thought they were really nice pictures. So again, we are seeing some in trees. So we do go out and we use this a bug buster to try and collect from trees. Um, and so this is a short video of uh, one of the colonies in a tree. So nice black bees here. This one was firstly um, found last year, so we're monitoring this. We have a, a, a beekeeper in the in the neighborhood that's monitoring that for us. Um, and this is, you know, a picture of one of our trees where we went bee hunting um, for for new uh, colonies this year with with Kiara. So you can watch out for her her presentation where she's going to um, identify or explain the method that we use. Um, to try and find these bees. It's not the same as that proposed by Tom Seeley. It's not a bee hunting with uh, forage and stuff. It's it's looking at the habitat and the area and, and other characteristics to try and find um, wild bees. And we found one in this little woodland outside Galway, in this old dead tree. And so we find that most of them are in old ash trees, beech, beech trees and um, oak trees. Uh, we're finding them in all kinds of buildings. So the picture on the right is the church in Canvara. It's not, it's not far from where I live. And the bees are up in the vent up on the top. And they've been there um, for a number of years now. We only managed to sample them this year. And the one in the middle is the colony from the, the tree in the previous picture that I showed you. So again, nice black bees here. Unfortunately, that colony didn't survive. And this this would be expected because Tom Seeley has reported that, you know, a high proportion of the newly established colonies will die in the first year. Um, and that colony, yes, it it, it died um, within a month of us actually sampling it. And but the, the cavity was facing up to the elements and we have a lot of rain in Ireland, so they just got got washed out. This is the Bee Hoover in Actions. So this is a tree in Ballantubber up in the middle of where is it? Ross Common, I think, in Ireland. So the vacuum, the suction on the vacuum is very light. The bees don't get damaged at all. Um, and then we can transfer it very easily into a falcon tube or into a jar and, and put it in a cooler. So one thing we're trying to develop here, which it takes time, so um, I'm hoping that we'll do a good job on this in the next few years, is to try and improve the monitoring of bee colonies. So it's one thing to go and sample it once, but it's another thing to track survival and track survival, not just of the colony, but also of the nest site, because I'm realizing how important the nest sites are. Um, even if a colony dies out after a year or two or three, it's still providing habitat for the next one. Um, and so studying that's important. So we have, um, we're, we're, when people are reporting colonies, we are asking them if they would be willing to become a custodian of that colony. And a lot of people who are living in the houses or, or near the colony in question are very happy to do so, in which case we ask them to fill out this simple form a few times a year. So we think um, the standard that I've read would be three times a year. So going into winter, after winter and um, after swarming. But in Ireland, spring is very tough, actually, and some bees come through the winter OK. And they seem fine, but then um, if we, especially if we have a cold or wet spring, um, some bees don't do so well. So we have an extra monitoring time uh, in between those things. So that's what we're hoping to carry forward into the future, that we'll have a, a very good um, record of, of the bees 
um, multiple times per year. So with the new data, so I had fourth year project students uh, from 2019 processing the data last year for their projects. We did some phenotypic and genotypic approaches. Now at that time we were using drawing, um, but we're also looking at the color of the bees um, when they come in. So we really see two major phenotypes, color phenotypes here. We see black bees uh, and we see these bees with the orange stripe, a very good orange stripe. We also see, I guess, bees difference in size and also difference in how black they are. So black versus brown. Um, but really, at least what we're trying to see from a hybridization point of view um, would be the, the gross color of, of the bees and then wing morphometrics, because that's what most beekeepers are using. So we were using drawing um, and surprisingly, with just 30 something colonies that they looked at last year, um, only one of the colonies fell into the box properly using drawing. So even though you see most of these uh, colonies are pure uh, using molecular data, the wing morphometric methods wasn't, didn't agree in all cases. Um, so the F13R colony on the right hand side is one that I know with mitochondrial data, it has, it, that has also showed a, um, a change in queen lineage. So it has become hybridized. But we're also now using the new program by Elise Pinto's group um, to retest uh, these and also going forward, we're going to use that program to see um, is there a better correlation between our molecular, our, our photographic and other morphological data and the morphometrics. Uh, with the second lot, so the new, the new set of data from 2019, whereas before none of the wild colonies had any evidence of queen lineage, with the additional sampling or the more recent sampling, we now have seven of those 30 colonies um, ended up with the C lineage. So these are represented by down here. They're missing this region of DNA uh, in the mitochondrial region that we sequence, which is the standard one. Um, so these would be characterized as C lineage. And, and then we have the ones on top are, are M lineage. And then we have one B that has got this region that's characteristic of the A lineage. Now in Ireland, we haven't processed many book fast and God only knows what book fast is. Um, this, um, you know, could is potentially a book fast B, um, but we're still trying to determine we, we don't have very many samples from book fast. So are we beginning to detect new hybridization? Is it just the increase in sampling uh, that has allowed us to do this? Or is it something that's happening in Ireland due to increased importations in recent years? Um, from Mark satellite analysis, we did add another 198 bees to the work of Hassett et al. Um, so my fourth years last year. And we find a really interesting signal here. We find alleles that are unique to Ireland and unique to the free living population. The diagram down here is represents it's it's a statistical analysis of the microsatellite data using a program called structure and what the program does is it looks at the the data from the microsatellite alleles and it puts them into groupings so what on the bottom along along the the y-axis here i've specified what the populations are the program um, is looking to see what how many groups is represented by the data um, and you know, you can look to see how, you know, how well statistically supported these groupings are. What's interesting here, and I don't want to put too much emphasis on it yet, but it's certainly something worth looking into. The ones in blue, the three populations in blue here are Carnic and Ligustica populations, part of the reference panel that Gabrielle has. And you can see that these are, the program puts them into one C cluster, a cluster representing the C lineage. And then the ones on, from there on in, in, in red and green, are M lineage bees. So populations four, five, six, and seven are the reference populations from Norway, Sweden, France, and Switzerland uh, from Gabrielle's reference panel. Eight and nine are our wild and managed bees in Ireland. Um, and what we're seeing is that structure is identifying a new cluster in our Irish bees. So yes, we have the, the European M alleles, or the alleles that will be associated with European M, um, but we have new alleles here, a lot of them. Some of them are present in the European reference populations as well, but they're more prevalent here. So do we have something unique in Ireland? Uh, do we have a unique population of AMM in Ireland? Do we have unique alleles? Um, what's going on here is really worth pursuing. For those interested here, 10 are UK bees. Uh, they're not from um, 
they're not from Cornwall. They're not those samples. They're additional samples from um, actually from Wales and Isle of Wight as well and um, o- other samples in England. And you see actually that the UK bees also have a lot of these green uh, signal. 11 is Dutch bees. Because of the, the, the relationship evidenced by the mitochondrial DNA, we, we sequence some of the bees uh, from the Netherlands. And you see they also have a mix, probably more green alleles in there than um than the other European populations and twelve is Iberiensis so at least sent us some bees and we did the microcellulite analysis on those as well so potentially something really interesting here uh, we do find more f- from the microcellulite analysis hints at other hybridization so this slide is very busy um it's just uh, the table shows the colony number. Then the mitochondrial, the lineage via mitochondrial DNA, the lineage via microsatellite DNA, and then using morphometrics, are they inside the, the box, i.e. are they characteristic of M lineage or if they fall outside the box, meaning that they're not AMM. And then just the color. So whether they have, whether they're black, BLK, whether they have little spots of orange, which would be totally acceptable within the M lineage, or whether they have B2T here, for example, is one with a great big orange stripe and the vast majority of those should be non-native. So what we find and actually is that we're getting a mixture now coming in. So we have some bees that have a that have a, an original C lineage. So the mitochondrial DNA shows that the queen is a C, but actually um, over time, um, that those that colony has and uh, the, the descendants or different generations of, of that lineage basically is back crossed to such an extent that it's pure M via microsatellite. So the nuclear DNA is M. And this indicates perhaps a colony that had been started off by a queen of a non-native uh, of, of a C lineage queen, um, but that has been back crossed over generations so that the um with with um native drones so that the native drones are masking out any C signal in the nuclear DNA. And some of these are black and some have color. Some of them are M virimorphometrics and some aren't. So it's really interesting this the, the diversity of, of data from different types of analysis. And we're really trying to do more work to, to nail this down. We also have some that are M via mitochondrial DNA. So the original queen was M, but more and morphometric data has also shown that they are M but they're C via microsatellites. And this um, could be a more recent uh, hybridization event with non-native drones. So this is where native queens are mating with non-native drones. Again, some offspring are colored and some are black. So does this represent, say, a mixture of recent and um, old hybridization events? And really, I guess those hybridization events are going to mix up or muddy some of the signal from color and from morphometrics. So we want to do some more work there. God, I'm sorry. Keep doing this. It's just that the the slide advancement is down at the bottom when I go down to do that. So we're moving on. Um, we got some extra money um, from Eva Crane Trust and the, and the NIBS, the Native Irish Honey Bee Society, to look at signatures of selection. So we really want to know, is there something unique going on in Ireland? Um, does Ireland have... Um, an ecotype or multiple ecotypes and we're working on both managed and and uh, wild bees to look at how they're surviving so we have a large number of beekeepers in ireland that are not treating and we are doing this work as well um looking at resilience in irish bees so we're doing we've moved to doing some whole genome sequencing um both of colonies at different time points so that we can prove the colony uh, longevity um, and also looking at a deeper look at hybridization and resilience, which isn't the purpose of this talk. And lo and behold, marvelously, I managed to get some funding. So I have four years of funding going into the future now to look at diversity and adaptation in wild honeybees using a multitude of approaches, but the molecular kind of approach is primarily pool seek. And the objectives are to increase awareness and access to recording tools, develop mobile phone apps, in order to increase the citizen science element to uh, for recording, making it easier for them to record and monitor colonies and really build that, um, that education and awareness across the country. People in Ireland are very interested in this and, and want to be involved. So in this study, we're going to do quite a lot of citizen science. Objective two is to investigate adaptation in wild colonies using a mixture of approaches. So morphology, genomics, biological factors, and museum specimens. So we're going to look at 
uh, diversity and adaptation over time. So we have identified bees dating back from the 1880s in, in our museum in Dublin. And with permission to uh, start working on those bees, we're also going to look at disease, pesticide, uh, habitat use uh, between wild and managed bees. That'd be a marvellous PhD project. And objective three is identify, investigate genetic diversity and population structure and integration in the wild honeybee cohort in Ireland. So we're going to sequence over 200 of these wild colony samples using PooSeq. So I have new collaborators coming on board for that project as well, but I actually would like to open an invitation for collaboration. So even Matthew produced earlier, we're only really starting to get a handle on, on how to analyze the data. So we would love to openly collaborate and share data and maximize the use of the data that we'll generate in Ireland. So I'm very open to sharing. So there are opportunities associated with this uh, project. We have a four-year postdoc that um, I would like really the focus for that person to be on data management, population, genomic skills, which I don't really have in my lab. So we need to build those skills in the lab. We have a four year PhD studentship on offer um, for really I'm open a biologist, but we'll learn who will learn genomic techniques, but we'll do some disease and um, plant use and uh, things like that and morphometrics. And I also uh, have a four year fixed term lectureship uh, opening up in the university as well. We had a cyber attack in our university about a month ago and all the systems, none of them are up yet. So I can't advertise um, yet for these posts, but uh, they will be advertised hopefully within the next few weeks. And I will try and interview as fast as possible. Um, but they are good well-paid four year positions. So if anybody you know is would be interested, please pass on my details. Um, so just very quickly, um, so we started doing some pool seek work. Um, so we are doing, um, we aim to do this for a number of hundreds of colonies. Um, we are doing it from 30 bees. So we have the bees, we freeze dry them and we photograph them at every step of the way. Um, you know, it's not going to be wonderfully professionally. What we, what we want to do is, is really look at the diversity of color and shape and sizes within, within the colonies. Um, and then we focus on the thorax. So here you see a, a picture of a bee thorax in between my fingers. Um, so they're freeze dried and then we can easily dissect the thorax and we take out the thora thoracic muscle um, into a, pet, a mortar, which is, I keep it mixed up, which is the mortar and which is the pestle. But anyway, we put into this little crucible, we pick out all the honeybee bits of, the, of um, skeleton so they can't be in there. And we grind it up so that we have a lovely fine uh, powder um, we extract. So what we do is we have them in groups of five bees. We want to maximize the contribution of every bee to the final pool seek. So and this was work actually Victoria, who's going to be talking in a few weeks. Um, this was a method she recommended to us. It's the power of collaboration um, so that we will hopefully by the way we're doing this, that our data will be comparable. She'll be able to use our data and hopefully vice versa, that we will, you know, uh, that the data will be usable by multiple groups. Anyway, so we sequence by Nova gene at a, at a depth of 50x. Um, and then do we have to look at, so we have six samples for each colony. Each uh, the DNA has been extracted from, 30, uh, from five Bs. We look at the concentration of the DNA that's coming out. Um, and also we look at the quality of the DNA for contamination. So, for example, this is not a great sample uh, from a contamination point of view. And then we we estimate how many uh, how many microliters, how much DNA from each of these pools should we contribute to the overall sample that gets sent for sequencing. So what we're trying to do here is is maximize, as I said, the contribution of all 30 bees to the final pool, se pool seek data. Um, so that we kind of really try and increase the diversity and have that our sample actually represents that colony. We did a little bit of work looking at whether you need a 10, 20 or 30 bees. Um, and also here, these plots show if you just squish up 30 bees uh, without doing the method we did, or so that would be, for example, here in the left, A3 um, would be thir is 30 bees just all squished up together. And number 78 is the sample where we did it in six groups of five bees. And what we see is that there is a bit of a difference. The number of SNPs that come back from the way we do it are higher, not hugely higher, but they are higher. And that if um, that there are alleles that would probably be missed um, if we didn't do it the way we did. 
However, it does depend on what your question is as to whether this is, so this is good for us to think about, okay, well, given the amount of time it takes to dissect all those bees, um, is it really worthwhile doing that given uh, the data that we get back and what questions we're asking? So this is why we did this work. Um, and this is, we've done very preliminary analysis. We're just getting the data back from the first set of samples, but this is, this is a heat map showing the correlation between allele frequencies. So down on the on the the, the right hand side and along the top are, are each colony in order and then you're comparing each colony to all other colonies in terms of allele frequencies so where you get a very dark navy and a value of one is a perfect correlation so all of the ones down the middle you know that diagonal line is each colony with itself and you'd expect it to have perfect correlation was kind of cool and we're still only really starting to look at this and we haven't even began to do all the cool work that Matteo has done. Um, we can see differences. So where, where the values are lighter. So F74 is jumping out here. This line um, is very different to all the other colonies. Um, so we want to go back and look at that. In fact, anywhere where the, where the lines are lighter blue means that they're different. And I can tell you that these, these ones are hybrids. So the F89, um, F104, I can't see um, when it's coming out here. So F85, um, F95, F100, these are all um, colonies that we know have banding, for example. Um, but what is very cool is here, oh God, this dark blue um, square in the middle here is, is F91 with a GT nook. And that is basically a, um, no, it's F, sorry. The top one is F27 with another F27. And this is two, two samples from the same colony multiple years apart. And we see that there's a, almost a perfect correlation between the allele frequencies, which helps tells us that this type of data is going to allow us to develop a method for checking uh, lineage long, longevity uh, in a particular nest. And the one, the square just beside it, just down from it, is slightly lighter, but it shows basically... Um, a colony and a, a swarm taken from the same area. So there's a very high correlation. Other kind of really cool things, I don't know who's listening here from Ireland, but for example, this little cluster, the top right left here, um, if you can see my cursor, um, with this kind of, th these dark colonies are untreated colonies from Louth. And this whole section here in the top left hand corner are the Louth bees. So um, we can see that they have a, high, a reasonably good correlation with, with themselves, but that the untreated colonies um, are, have a much higher correlation with each other. We have a little square here. These are uh, to the bottom right of that. These are colonies from uh, Galway, uh, South Galway, whereas down on the very right, these four little um, little boxes of dark color are actually bees from uh, a beekeeper in Connemara who doesn't treat his bees either. So it's just that some of these little little um, sections of high correlation are really, for me, kind of pointing at the um, local mating and the importance of, of local bees because we're picking out, I can pick out the Connemara bees. I'm just going to show you a, a dendrogram quickly. Oh God, I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, a dendrogram. Now, I'm not going to put any confidence in this at all. It's really just quick results that we're looking at. But um, what I can see here is a clade um, grouping of Connemara bees. And these are um, there. So they're more similar to each other than they are to anything else. And here are the bees on the bottom. The big box are bees from Louth. Um, and we have a separate uh, grouping of the untreated and the treated bees. And the circle, the orange circle on top is, is another um, beekeeper from, from Galway. So they're actually grouping together and this it's worth it's worth pursuing uh, for, for further interest. So on the top, the top green box are, are the same colony samples years apart, two years apart, and they're showing good correlation. Um, and so we also have the third green area circles um, are showing basically two colonies. This, the, the square has moved up. F47 and F104 are from Spittle and Furbo, which are two neighbouring little villages in Connemara. So it's really, I think we're going to get really nice data here on local ecotypes and also um, maybe indicators for mating and for breeding stations in Ireland. So um, 
I just wanted to say here quickly that these colonies are in the UK too. I started collaborating with, with beekeepers in the UK. Um, these two, Philippe and Joe, have been working on the Broughton Estate and the Blenheim Palace Estates, old oak forest in the UK, and they're finding some really cool uh, stuff here. We're we're gonna we're doing some pool seek uh, work on on the their colonies, but they're gonna watch out for their presentation because they have been bee hunting in these areas and really finding out loads of really interesting uh, characteristics of these um, bees that are nesting in these old oak forests. So these, some of these are the oldest oak forests in Europe. And we think that probably a unique ecosystem and the bees have uniquely adapted to these ecosystems. So listen in, watch out for their talks coming up in Sikkim. Just to mention Honeybee Watch as well. Um, this is a, a citizen science approach to study free living colonies right across the world, but at the moment focusing on bees in Europe and really need more beekeepers uh, and scientists to register and join in and, and uh, join the program so that we can get a, a, a European perspective on what's happening with wild bees. As you know, in 2014, the last um, IUCN red list uh, were scuppered because there was no information about wild bees. Um, so therefore, it, it has actually hampered uh, possibilities of conserving them because it wasn't known if they existed or not. So Honeybee Watch is a great initiative to help us actually conserve uh, black bees, if we, especially if we can find wild populations. And my last point here uh, before I finish is um, is to say that, you know, I'm interested in, in bees originally from, I'm interested in it from an evolutionary perspective and, and biodiversity and integration and it's teaching me all sorts of things and methods. Um, but really the work that we're doing and, and work with Sikkim and, and the, the aims of this is really important, has really important outcomes. So in Ireland, as you know, people know now about that we do have something really worthwhile protecting in Ireland, you know, beekeepers and members of the public. We have a, you know, reasonably pure population of AMM here, which is beginning, we think, to be impacted by hybridization. And certainly that will be patchy. So particularly if you think of all the queens that were introduced to Ireland because of Brexit. So introduced to Britain via Ireland last year through Brexit. But the few years before that has an increased number of queens been imported into Ireland. And we're starting to see evidence of that. Some places now in County Clare here in, in South Galway, most of the bees that we would sample will be have been hybridized. Um, and there are other pockets that are really black. So our work, I'm really proud for my small role in this, that our work has provided scientific evidence that allows the Native Irish Honeybee Society and collaborators to push for a protection of Native Irish Honeybee Bill. So we've provided information that the Senator um, can use to bring forward this bill. And I think even the lawyers uh, that are working on this pro bono have accepted that the scientific evidence is there, that we have something to protect. And actually the government is negligent and flouting many EU regulations by not doing this. So this Protection of the Native Irish Honey Bill was introduced to our upper house on Wednesday this week. And it'll take about 10 layers of political wrangling to get anywhere. So keep your fingers and toes and eyes and everything crossed that this will pass and that we will be able to protect our lovely Irish honeybee um, population here in Ireland. And then just to say to watch out for Aoife's talk from the Native Irish Honeybee Society, where she will tell you more about um, the NIBS's efforts to protect and conserve AMM in Ireland. Thanks a lot. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for listening.